When thinking about the corporate world of business transactions and globalized industry, it is easy to overlook some of the smaller titans in less traditional industries that not only impact our lives, behavioral patterns, and cultural identity, but also represent intelligent, conscientious, and innovative theories of business. This is the era of big business, which often seems disconnected from small towns or individual families, but we also welcome corporations into our daily lives, tangling our everyday routines with the ebb and flow of commercial entities. The trick, for businesses at least, is to find that perfect balance between acting as a stock market superpower and personalizing your business to appeal to everyone, welcoming everyone into your customer base like an old friend, perhaps a friend with whom you might sit down and have a coffee. With the ever-increasing competition to be a corporate heavyweight, this fundamental ability to connect with every consumer and have them actively engage as a repeat customer often gets left by the wayside. Quantity too frequently supersedes quality, and the loss of a loyal customer is quickly brushed off as new energy and capital is poured into finding a replacement. However, the throwaway culture of modern life is a poor model for businesses, which should constantly strive not only to attract new customers, but also to retain and increase the loyalty of existing supporters through new directions, offerings, ideas, and innovations. While there are a number of excellent corporate examples of this mentality, there are some that rise above the pack into a league all their own. In 1971, a small coffee bean seller in Seattle began a caffeinated journey towards this elite echelon that would eventually make them one of the most respected and successful brands in the world. From Corner Cafe to Coffee Kingpin Being instantly synonymous with an industry is a rare achievement in business, but there are certain examples, typically having achieved this level of notoriety, by innovating something so integral in the industry that the name gains permeance. Ford, Apple, Amazon. These words have other meanings, and yet when we hear them, we don't think of fording rivers, Isaac Newton's inspiration, nor a jungle in South America, respectively. We immediately associate these words with the world-changing car company, one of the most innovative and dominant tech corporations of the 21st century, and the largest online retailer on the planet. These instinctual associations come from the company's global fame and recognition, but also because they have become ingrained in our daily lives. Although not everyone drives a Ford, most people drive cars, which can be traced back to the founding of that groundbreaking company in 1903. More than one million homes in America own an Apple product, and Amazon ships approximately three million boxes every day. Those companies have clearly formed a niche in our lives, a permanent relationship that is unlikely to deteriorate or be forgotten for many years, even if the occasional customer switches to riding a bike, owning a PC, or ceasing their online shopping habits. Another part of daily life for billions of people around the globe is coffee. More than 500 billion cups of coffee are drunk on this planet each year, an amount so staggering that it's difficult to comprehend. There are thousands of coffee companies out there, ranging from independent single-location retailers and ancient cafes on Parisian avenues to globally recognized brands that offer caffeine fixes from Palm Springs to Ethiopia. However, only one company has opened an average of two stores every day since 1987. Starbucks Just as with the corporate kings listed above, Starbucks has become interchangeable with coffee, as you so often hear and hardly notice. Do you want a Starbucks? Or, I'm going to get a Starbucks. For millions of people in America alone, Starbucks is a part of their daily life, either in the form of a necessity a temptation, or a treat. Regardless of the relationship that people have with the company, one thing is clear. Starbucks has ingratiated itself into cultural identity and has ingrained its products in the hearts and minds of coffee drinkers around the world. 
To so highly praise a company that grinds, brews, and sells coffee beans seems almost hyperbolic, given that making a cup of coffee doesn't require much time, effort, or skill. Millions of people make themselves cups of coffee every day, so how would one company manage to pull in over $15 billion per year in global revenue? What sort of magic beans do they put into every one of their triple vente soy no foam lattes? In fact, there is nothing supernatural or underhanded in their production of coffee, although they do scour the planet for some of the choicest coffee beans available. No, the mines at Starbucks have simply percolated for four decades and come out swinging some of the strongest, yet simplest, business techniques that continue to bring them success year in and year out. The company may have changed, but their fundamental plan certainly hasn't. Building a third place between home and work. Our lives often seem dominated by those two locations, and a frequently mind-numbing commute is what happens in between. But Starbucks wanted to change all that. They wanted to provide a welcoming, dynamic, and service-oriented destination for people anywhere and anytime. Starbucks is more than just a coffee shop. It has become a symbol of community, creativity, and collaboration in more than 23,000 locations around the globe. That role transcends a simple coffee shop, but as their success has grown, so too has their competition. To counter their encroaching rivals, Starbucks has maintained some of their fundamental values and practices, but have also become one of the most flexibly evolving companies in operation today. They epitomize the idea of a dynamic, agile, and constantly innovative company that clearly understands its role in the lives of its customers, yet never stops finding new ways to surprise, delight, and attract coffee drinkers around the world. Partners, not pawns. When most companies discuss the elements of success, the natural actors in the transaction, part of the business, are the company and the customer. Therefore, many companies pour all of their focus into the company branding, reputation, marketing, and products, essentially handling their side of things as well as possible in order to draw customers and increase revenue. However, in the majority of transactions, this simple two-sided equation doesn't reflect reality. The third key part of this exchange is the employee of the company, the walking, talking representation of any company's interests. Employee happiness has been a growing area of focus in the business world, but it has been slow going in many industries that have struggled to move past the image of part-time hourly wage workers as transient bodies to stand behind a cash register or answer a phone. In most companies, workers represent the lifeblood of creativity, customer loyalty, high quality products, and friendly service. A corporate image and purchased products can only go so far to create a relationship between a consumer and a company. Employees are the essential glue that holds the whole operation together. While the key role of employees in tech companies and other more modern and collaborative industries has been recognized and emphasized more universally, retail operations, including the food and beverage industry, are still slow on the uptake of this concept. Starbucks, on the other hand, has risen to the top of the pack in many ways when it comes to the treatment, training, empowerment, and involvement of employees. Starbucks doesn't view their employees as faceless Java jockeys. They are partners and collaborative assets that help boost the company's reputation and popularity with everything they do. Starbucks sees employees as so much more than simple workers that they've eliminated the word entirely. The people who greet you, take your order, and make your delicious Vente house blend are baristas, and with good reason. Starbucks baristas are both artists and scientists, carefully creating and customizing tens of millions of increasingly complex coffee creations every year. Not only that, they are the face of the brand, the memorable point of the entire experience of walking into one of their retail locations. People who spend five minutes between walking in and walking out of a Starbucks probably couldn't tell you what art was on the walls, what music was playing, or whether the store layout was efficient, but they will certainly be able to comment on the service they received and the quality of the coffee in their hand. 
Baristas are more than their name, which translates to coffee brewers, might suggest. They are highly trained ambassadors of the brand and also have a voice in the way their business is run. As partners, all employees, full-time and part-time, enjoy health benefits and stock options. They were the first privately owned company to do this for their entire staff all the way back in 1991. Beyond that, their SSC, Starbucks Support Center, may be their corporate headquarters, but it is more of an information hub where regional and local concerns can funnel towards rather than the point of distribution for all rules, regulations, and ideas to the rest of the retail locations. In other words, there is a great deal of independence in every Starbucks location, which allows managers and employees alike to make decisions that will shape their working environment. Every community and client base is different, which means that every Starbucks should be different. The baristas and managers at these individual locations are empowered to make decisions for themselves, without running them all the way up the flagpole for approval. Starbucks trusts that in the pursuit of their end goals as a company, their intelligent and adaptable workers will make the right choices. The company also keeps the employees active at higher levels. They have sent countless baristas to their coffee fields in South America and other far-flung places of the world to personally see the process in order to better understand the work and time that goes into developing exceptionally good coffee. They run large-scale employee events almost every year to increase excitement about new products, keep employees informed and engaged with long-term goals of the company, and essentially utilize their massive workforce as beta testers. Starbucks leadership welcomes critiques on new product ideas or launches from those people who know best. The baristas who deal with and learn about customer interests every day on the front lines of the business. As employees rise through the ranks, they are often rotated in and out of the head office, allowing their fresh experience from the field impact and influence the conversations and decisions being made at the corporate headquarters. Eventually, they are released back into the market, usually at a higher position and pay grade, sharing their new knowledge with other baristas in the shops, perpetuating this open line of communication that keeps every individual in the company connected. One of the best examples of how much employees affect the decision-making process of Starbucks is in one of the company's most successful products, the Frappuccino. Blended coffee drinks were becoming popular at Starbucks' rival stores, but Starbucks management had decided to remain firm in their old-school vision and refused to move into this trend. A group of employees in Southern California came up with the idea of the Frappuccino and pitched it to their supervisor. The idea moved up the chain quickly, was given approval, despite the CEO's initial refusal, and now brings in $2 billion of Starbucks revenue each year. The success of the company is directly linked to the success and happiness of its workers, not only for the obvious reason of gainful employment, but also because of stock option holders. They truly are partners in the enterprise. Starbucks invests energy, capital, and trust in their workers more than almost any other company out there, because when it comes to selling great coffee, the brew is always better from a happy, knowledgeable, empowered, and passionate barista. Let the coffee do the talking. One of the most noticeable changes to the business world, and consequently the entire world, is the constant encroachment of advertising in every square inch of consumable space. Buildings have become billboards, taxis and private cars are mobile commercial spots, and it seems like every television drama has shrunk to 38 minutes of actual content to allow for as much ad space as humanly possible. Our social media platforms are being crowded into the center of the screen to create more and more space, while every sports team from Houston to Hong Kong and from Little League to the EPL has half a dozen sponsors emblazoned on their jerseys and kits. Marketing and advertisement are massively powerful industries that affect the movement of hundreds of billions of dollars around the world. A good advertising campaign can make or break a company whether or not they have changed or innovated their product in any way. Countless marketing gurus make million-dollar salaries for offering their sage advice on how to manipulate and influence consumers. Given this undeniable trend towards a planet saturated by flashing lights and clever slogans, it seems almost impossible to have a successful business without pouring 10%, at least, of your capital into advertising.
Well, impossible has never been a word that Starbucks particularly cares for, and the company is annually praised and perpetually studied for their ability to attract and retain a fiercely loyal consumer base while spending only a fraction of what other major companies allot for marketing. Despite the fact that Starbucks has millions of dollars that they could pour into seasonally rotating ad campaigns and new billboards on every street corner, they choose not to. Not to duplicate what has been said, but Starbucks has always believed in spending just as much money speaking to their employees as they do speaking to their customers, because as brand ambassadors, they are far more effective than a clever catchphrase on a bus stop, beyond the importance that every employee plays in marketing and maintaining loyalty and relevance to consumers, the company itself employs sound business strategies to keep people coming back for more. These marketing strategies may seem unconventional, but they serve dual purposes and are already an essential part of why Starbucks is so popular. By embracing quality and spending their money on cultivating, acquiring, transporting, grinding, and brewing the best possible coffee in the world, they can lock in customer loyalty simply because they make one of the best cups of coffee, if not the best, in the business. As mentioned earlier, the idea of becoming more than a coffee shop, like a middle destination between home and work, adds an element of desirability to their business model that people will remember. Starbucks is basically a fast food joint that sells coffee, but then also has couches, electrical outlets, charging stations, live music, snacks, and mood lighting to double as a destination either for business meetings, quiet reading, freelance work, or a relaxing cup of tea after a long day of work. Waiters won't be rushing you with checks or wiping down your tables as a hint that it's time to go. People feel comfortable staying in a Starbucks for hours on end, and most understand the unwritten agreement that purchasing a cup of coffee every few hours is simply the polite thing to do. How many other fast food drink establishments would you feel comfortable sitting in for three hours, reading a book and looking out the window? Starbucks has made itself a destination rather than a stopping point along the way, and that is an extremely valuable and free form of marketing. Once you leave most stores, the next time you interact or engage with them as a company will resemble one of two scenarios. Experiencing some form of their marketing, poster, billboard, newspaper, ad, or email, or when you return to the store. However, Starbucks has put a lot of energy into their online presence to create a community for users, inviting them to share their experiences at Starbucks, funny stories, history of the brand, or even creative ideas for improvement. This sparks discussions, many of which include Starbucks representatives who are very active on their social media platforms, so customers feel like they are actually being listened to, even from an international brand. That ability to shrink a $15 billion company into the personable and accessible small business is priceless and creates a powerful and long-lasting bond with more internet-savvy customers. In terms of their social media presence, Starbucks has the second most popular Facebook page for any consumer brand products with more than 27.5 million fans. The Starbucks Twitter account has a similarly staggering number of followers at more than 2 million. Unlike many other companies that swamp inboxes and notification pages with relatively useless content, Starbucks tries to actively engage their consumers in fun, non-invasive ways that rarely try to sell anything. In fact, most of the activity on these social media platforms is from followers and fans, not from the company itself. A final note on the online side of things. Starbucks was one of the first retail brands to offer internet connectivity in every one of its locations, providing a known destination for anyone who needs to get online, even in cities where Wi-Fi is spotty at best and non-existent at worst. This common knowledge makes Starbucks a destination for people that may not even drink coffee, but simply want to stop in, check their email, grab a smoothie and a muffin, and get on with their life. Perhaps the most infrequently discussed part of Starbucks' unique marketing strategy is something that costs them absolutely no money. In fact, the more marketing of this kind there is, the more money they make. When a person gets a Starbucks coffee and walks out the coffee shop door, that white cup and the green mermaid siren is unmistakable. You may walk down the street with it, set it on top of your car, carry it into your office, and possibly leave it sitting on your desk for an entire day. There is no other purchased product that is displayed by consumers for so long, so frequently, and in such a clearly visible space as a cup of coffee. 
Most people don't go shopping every day, so those swinging advertisements don't measure up to a cup of coffee, and even designer bags and clothes can be difficult to identify. Fast food bags from McDonald's may be a daily purchase, but it's not something that most people leave lying around for others to see, nor is it a bizarre status symbol that this elite coffee brand seems to have become. Cars are obviously long-term mobile advertisements, but the luxury industry and the daily consumption industry are two very different things. Now, obviously, the coffee cup advertisement angle is something very specific to the company, but when you consider that sort of real-world presence and proof of purchase within Starbucks' already successful, unique, and relatively inexpensive approach to advertising itself, it makes for one of the strongest brands in the world. Going Global when you say the word Starbucks to someone, whether they are in Texas, London, or Tokyo, there is a very good chance that their eyes will light up in recognition. In fact, there is a strong chance that they've been to a Starbucks before, perhaps even in the past week or so. Starbucks may have begun as a global brand and established a strong business model that works in the American market, but there is no doubt that this caffeine titan is now a global powerhouse. Its first international location, aside from Canada, was opened in Tokyo in 1996, and the company hasn't looked back, now boasting more than 9,000 locations in 63 foreign countries, in addition to the 13,000 locations in the United States. The success of Starbucks in America has largely been due to their ability to remain a local favorite, managing not to lose their unique community atmosphere in every location, despite the common trend of larger food and beverage companies to become standardized and essentially identical. By maintaining the feeling of a corner coffee shop, Starbucks was able to solidify its dominance in America's coffee niche. But there was some concern that they wouldn't be able to achieve the same goals, at least with the same tactics, in the global market. Critics argued that Starbucks would have to become more uniform in its approach and appearance as trying to customize store designs product offerings, and marketing strategies for every country would be too challenging and would stretch resources unnecessarily. Never one to let their ears be bent by critics or naysayers, Starbucks implemented the same strategy in their foreign locations as they had throughout their empire in America. They didn't move into a cookie-cutter style of franchising, nor did they sell out or quietly allow a drop in quality or customer service. Their brand consistency has been the stuff of legend and for the retail industry, while paradoxically offering unique experiences, ambiance, products and services in their different locations. The same held true abroad, and they quickly moved into a powerful position in dozens of international markets. Imagine walking through the streets of Paris, strolling by dozens or hundreds of cafes in a single day. With coffee culture being such a key element of Parisian life, it might seem impossible for a huge coffee chain like Starbucks to get their foot in the door, let alone flourish among a seemingly infinite number of quaint, intimate, independent cafes in the city of light. However, what if the only thing that defined a cafe as a Starbucks was the logo and a name? What if the quality of the coffee was superior to most other offerings on the Champs Elysees? What if the tables inside were weathered and beaten antiques from flea markets outside of Paris? And if the espresso machine looked as though it had survived World War II, yet still cranked out exceptional brews? Starbucks' global development team knew that moving into major coffee markets would be a challenge, so they tried to blend in as much as possible. Inserting a Starbucks retail location that would be appropriate for the Upper West Side of New York City into the Latin Quarter of Paris wouldn't make sense nor would it attract new customers, but toning down the design, changing up the menu, and trying to blend into the market was key. Sourcing local materials for decoration and furnishings, tailoring the interior and exterior to fit the neighborhood, and even using local artists and musicians to create an attractive atmosphere was more costly than simply dropping an identical McDonald's into the middle of London, Tokyo, or Berlin, but it has allowed Starbucks to quickly and quietly establish itself as a globally accepted and competitive player in the market. There have been countless stories of popular American brands trying to cross over into international markets and failing quite spectacularly. Starbucks did its homework found the weak spots in the implementation policies of other brands, and avoided making those same errors. Their initial approach to global success helped them establish themselves and gain a foothold in dozens of markets, but Starbucks is not nearly as dominant in the rest of the world as it is in America. 
Therefore, a new strategy has developed in recent years. Selling coffee is Starbucks' proverbial bread and butter in most markets, but for certain massive international markets, coffee simply isn't king. China, with its population of over 1.3 billion people, largely prefer tea to coffee. And Starbucks isn't about to give up on a potential customer base four times larger than the United States simply because of their reputation as a coffee company. The company now has approximately 4,000 stores in the Asian Pacific region, including more than 1,000 locations in mainland China, and it is likely to become the second largest market in the company by the end of 2014. Starbucks purchased Tivana, an American specialty tea company, in the final hours of 2012 for a cool $620 million, which was the first major step towards cutting into the $90 billion global tea market. Starbucks wants to mimic its coffee shop style in tea drinking countries by becoming the international tea house of choice. Although tea is sold in every Starbucks location, there will be a much stronger emphasis on Starbucks as a high-quality, artisanal tea distributor in primarily tea-drinking countries. Also, by offering certain locations in China as coffee shops and others as tea houses, Starbucks will begin winning over that massive market from two key angles. By maintaining a local customized feel in every store, in addition to considering cultural and societal preferences in their international locations, Starbucks has become one of the most popular, adaptive, and respected retail brands on the planet. You get what you pay for. One of the major critiques that has always circulated around Starbucks is that it is overpriced. To be fair, Starbucks does have some of the most expensive prices for coffee on the market, particularly its high-end Starbucks original drinks like Frappuccinos. However, the company also has mid-range pricing and a variety of sizes to accommodate more price-sensitive customers. Many critics have pointed towards McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts, at least in American markets, that are stealing many of the more frugal customers from Starbucks ranks, yet Starbucks has remained steadfast in its profit margins and pricing for years. Furthermore, with the exception of the occasional seasonal drink release or a very limited time offer, Starbucks doesn't offer sales or special deals, nor do they have value menus or savor specials. There is a very simple reason for this. Starbucks is a luxury brand. Despite Starbucks' ability to fit into any situation, adapt to different cultures, blend into communities, and appeal to a vast range of consumers, there is no denying that Starbucks has established itself as a luxury brand in the world of coffee. Just as with luxury brands of cars, purses, and watches, they offer high-quality, consistent, recognizable, and elite products that cost more than competitors' products. There are countless theories about luxury culture and competition, as well as why it exists in consumer culture. Basically, having a luxury class of products helps to fill out the market, as many consumers enjoy having the best. While millions of people might go to McDonald's for a cup of coffee for less than $1, there are millions of other people who actually enjoy spending $4 for a fancier cup of coffee in a recognizable cup, in addition to knowing that the coffee will be of the highest quality. You truly do get what you pay for, and Starbucks understands that it has a large swath of loyal customers who want to patronize a luxury brand every morning. By offering sales, discounts, special offers, or punch cards, one free coffee after every 10, Starbucks would be cheapening their brand reputation, which would make it far easier for competitors to take over more of their market share. Starbucks is confident that they can maintain their client base and quality level despite their higher prices because they are selling more than a cup of coffee. They are selling an experience, a comfortable space, a worktop, a community meeting point, and a sense of familiarity. In essence, Starbucks is selling a lifestyle and their $15 billion in revenue clearly shows that there are plenty of people willing to pony up some extra money to get a slice of that life. Now, with all that being said, Starbucks is still not a stubborn or foolish brand. And given specific economic indicators, they are willing to make a change if necessary. Since 2013, Starbucks has done something that has surprised and confused some competitors and market analysts, but it has clearly worked for the company, which continues to enjoy record profits and growth. Their least expensive coffee drinks are gradually dropping in price while their more complex Starbucks original drinks are actually increasing in price. While this seems counterproductive to attracting consumers in a struggling economy, this is actually Starbucks' newest strategy to increase their market dominance. By maintaining the exclusivity and luxury level of their specialty drinks, 
Starbucks doesn't risk becoming associated with discount brands, coupons, or mid-level retailers. However, in an effort to protect their younger client base and more frugal fans, they are offering some lower-priced options, particularly on tea, iced drinks, and other products that are directly associated with coffee itself. The company is able to maintain its image as a luxury coffee brand and is counting on customer loyalty to remain strong as they move into this next chapter of their history. The company has been stretching itself considerably in recent years with their massive Asian Pacific expansions, company acquisitions, retail space renovations, and innovative new cafe launches. The last thing they want to do is see a fall off in customer loyalty. The key demographic to maintaining their luxury brand aura is the high-end coffee drinkers, but the foundation of their company may be shifting to quantity over quality. Targeting massive international markets and spreading their reach seems to suggest that Starbucks is becoming more flexible within their own identity, realizing that to compete with everyone in the beverage market, they will need to balance a number of corporate personalities. Attempting to wear so many different hats in so many different markets is undoubtedly a challenge, but the leadership, tradition, vision, loyalty, and reputation of Starbucks will surely carry them through. Beans to Billions There are plenty of people who say that in tough economic times, a brand like Starbucks shouldn't be as successful as it continues to be, but reality tells a different story. Year in and year out, Starbucks continues to expand and diversify its offerings to new markets around the world, while still maintaining a firm grip on its domestic dominance in the United States. If there was only one or two pillars of Starbucks' success, then cracks would almost certainly begin to appear, and the era of luxury coffee might show signs of coming to an end. But that isn't the situation. By investing time, energy, and resources to perfecting their business model on all sides, Starbucks has weathered countless economic storms and cultural trends that have drowned competitors in myriad industries. It's difficult to envision Starbucks as a company that operates under the slowly but surely philosophy, but that is precisely how they've achieved such monumental success. The company doesn't implement new business ideas until they are polished and perfected, nor do they cut corners to save on expenses and improve their bottom line. The company takes calculated risks and solidifies its position in every new market, ensuring that previous ventures are secure and successful before moving on to the next big thing. All of this progress is dependent on their outstanding employees and baristas who are consistently praised as some of the most superbly trained and empowered workers in the retail industry. Combining that personal presence with unique marketing strategies and an increasingly global presence results in a solid and unwavering level of success in an extremely competitive industry. These are the fundamental elements without which the company would have failed long ago. Shifting a consumer product from a novelty to a necessity is every retail establishment's dream, yet Starbucks has actually achieved it. They've created and maintained a loyal customer base that spans more than 60 countries, and they've achieved this by remaining consistent in their underlying vision, by displaying dynamism in their individual practices. For a massive international company, they are surprisingly flexible and adaptive, owing to their empowered and independent retail locations that can make their own decisions and implement their own strategies, based on their individual marketing experiences and innovative ideas. While this business model isn't possible for certain industries or companies, the fundamental ideas that drive Starbucks are universal. Investing in employees, unique marketing techniques, intelligent globalization, and customizing your offerings to your target markets, among others. Every company is different, and every road to success has its own unexpected pitfalls and obstacles. But if one thing can be learned from Starbucks for decades of success is this. If a company establishes a feasible goal, delivers what it promises, takes calculated risks, and refuses to compromise on quality, then it will inevitably succeed. If this sounds condescendingly simple, that's because it is. Sometimes the simplest mantra is the one that will result in the best outcome. The most powerful corporations have to start somewhere, even if that now legendary company began with little more than a dream and a handful of coffee beans.